Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeff Goldberg. I'm the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic. Um, welcome to this week's edition of The Big Story, which is our digital event series where we talk to uh, Atlantic writers about their latest work and also their not so latest work. Uh, as always, I will ask uh, those of you who don't already subscribe to The Atlantic to subscribe to The Atlantic. Um, Donald Trump does not want you to subscribe to The Atlantic. Um, he made that clear again on Twitter today. Um, so uh, that's not a good enough reason to, to subscribe. Uh, the great reason to subscribe is you get to read writers like Ann Applebaum all the time. Uh, Ann is uh, my guest this week. Um, uh, Ann, of course, is a Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, an author of our latest magazine cover story, The Collaborators. Um, it's about the nature of complicity. It's pretty deep. Uh, and it's a deep historical philosophical look at political complicity, um, why people become complicit with things they don't like or, uh, or, or do things that seem to run against their stated ideologies, belief systems. Um, and in, more specifically, it's about why uh, some conservators, many Republicans, um, have uh, chosen to support Donald Trump when privately uh, they have uh, very different feelings than those than those that they express in in, in public. So, Anne, um, welcome to uh, welcome to the broadcast. Um, before we begin um, our discussion, I just want to remind all of our viewers that you can uh, send us your questions in the in the Q and A box. Um, keep them very short if you can, or short as possible, and keep them uh, on topic, and also keep them in the form of a question. That requires a question mark at the end of, of, of your sentence. Um, be sure also to tell us where you're watching from. Uh, that, that's always very useful for our audience to know. And um, so with that, let me um, formally, I don't know what formally means in this case, but informally welcome Anne <laughs> now, uh, who I haven't talked to since on the phone last night, um, uh, from, your, uh, from your bunker uh, somewhere in, in the old country. Um, Anne, thanks for doing this. Uh, why don't we just start where, and I hate to do this to people, but I do it all the time. It's like, Tell us what, uh, tell us in two minutes what your 10,000 word masterpiece cover story is about. So I thank you, Jeff. You have read it, but just give us, give us in your mind what you think it's about. Um, yes, thank you for that nice open-ended question, Jeff. Um, <laughs> and, and greetings to everybody from, yes, I am in Northwest Poland. So, um, you know, good, good evening if you're in Europe and good afternoon if you're in the United States. People don't so, know this, but the Atlantic has bureaus in all four quadrants of Poland. <laughs> Now. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's Leaning right. Leaning heavily into our Polish coverage. That's right. That's right. I, I am the I am the Polish bureau chief, but of course there are many other many <laughs> many more of us here. Um, no, so the, the 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 piece was a. I mean, funny enough, for me the the origin of the piece came. Um, the idea for it, in some ways, came from um, from watching the funeral of John McCain. Um, and what was so strange about that moment, if you, you know, if you can remember back that far, it wasn't that long ago, but so much has happened since then that it feels like another era. Um, if you remember then that the, the whole, at the funeral, there were these displays and symbols of kind of bipartisan American patriotism. Um, there were flags, um, McCain's sons were there. They're both military officers. They were wearing their uniforms. Um, people from both sides of the political aisle there were there. Barack Obama was there and George W. Bush was there. Um, and there was a sense of, you know, the whole, you know, the, the kind of unified political establishment all being in one place. And of course, Trump was not there. He was not invited. He had insulted McCain during his campaign and his widow, I think McCain himself, but then his widow asked that he, that he not come and he didn't. And this is when I realized that, that what I was watching was, a group of people who were under an kind of occupying ideology, you know, that we were seeing um, the United States democratically elected establishment. So people chosen according to our constitutional rules, according to, um, you know, voting systems we've had in place for hundreds of years, um, who felt somehow alien from the person who was in the White House. And that was clear in all kinds of symbolic ways all the way through the ceremony. Um, and this looked to me very strange. And with my kind of 
hat on. So I've written a lot of books about the history of Eastern Europe. In particular, I wrote one book about the Sovietization of Eastern Europe after the war. This is when the Soviet Union came in and took over Eastern European countries and brought in this alien ideology and made people go along with it. Um, and this began to make me think of that. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that actually Trumpism, which is not at all what it was sold as during the election campaign, it's not really populism for the workers, it's not really spending on infrastructure, it's kind of tax cuts for the rich and favors for Trump's friends, and above all, the twisting of the American political system for the benefit of Trump, and for his personal benefit, and for his psychological benefit, and his political benefit. Um, and I began to understand that people who were working for him or working with the administration were behaving a lot like people in an occupied country, you know, and the kinds of language they were using and the excuses they were giving for what they were doing. Some, some people with, with good intentions, actually, some with less so, sounded to me like things I'd heard before, um, you know, in Eastern Europe, in, in occupied France. And so, and so the piece goes through, um, gives some examples of that kind of experience and some people who lived through it and the different choices that people made, and then looks at what some of those excuses are and quote some Trump administration officials using them, some off the record, some on the record, some famous ones. Right. Talk, talk a little bit about, I mean, when we, when we started talking about this, um, you know, one of the thing, one of the temptations is to go, of course, whenever you're talking about complicity is, you know, um, to, to succumb to that, you know, argumentum ad Hitlerum, you know, like, like let's, let's, how fast can this conversation just get to the Nazis? Um, <laughs> It's very tempting. It's the Nazis don't exist outside of history, so they're, they're it's permissible to talk about them. On the other hand, it's kind of the easy, obvious way out, and frequently you can succumb to exaggeration. Also, um, but what you did was interesting. You looked at at post-war Germany. I mean, you 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 started the piece by talking about East Germany, and and just to fr frame that out a little bit. Both the characters you chose to focus on, and also the the observation, which I think is one of the key observations of the piece, which is that complicity is normal. Dissidence is not normal, is outside the norm. Could talk about that in the East German context. So East Germany is interesting because although it's true that at the, at the very beginning of the, what, the formation of what became of East Germany, there was a lot of violence used because this was the, the Soviet, Soviet Union Red Army conquering Germany, actually, um, Throughout most of the history of East Germany, there wasn't a huge amount of violence used. Um, and the techniques that were used to get people to go along with things were rather psychological and economic and, and so on. And so that's why it's a more interesting comparison than, 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 than Hitler's Germany. Um, and the two characters I chose are, are, are famous because, to, to begin the piece with, are famous because they actually had very, very similar backgrounds. They were both um, German, children of German communists who left Hitler's Germany in the 30s. They both grew up in the Soviet Union as teenagers. They went to special schools for children of communists, kind of nomenclatura schools. Um, during the war, they were both at special training camps in, in, in Siberia. And they were both brought back into Berlin after, 19, after the end of the war in May 1945 to help set up the country. And they were both immediately very prominent, very high ranking. They were given fancy villas to live in you know, important jobs. Um, and one of them, Marcus Wolf, became a radio announcer at that time. The other one, Wolfgang Leonard, was put in charge of a part of the Berlin city government. They were both in their 20s, they were very young. Um, very quickly, after, after th you know, three or four years in, that, in, in East Germany, they, they diverged. Um, and they diverged because Wolfgang Leonard, you know, he was there in 1945, 46, 47, 48, he slowly came to understand that the idealism that he had managed to bring with him from the Soviet Union, the belief that they would be able to create a new Germany and a better place and a prosperous, equal society, um, was that it was false. And that the ideology that was in fact being brought in was very hierarchical, it was very repressive. Um, the Soviet Union were gonna be in charge, not the German communists. They were really just kind of lackeys to the Soviet Communist Party. And he made a very brave decision, which was to leave the country. And he very, was very dramatic. He escaped. He, he called his mother with a password. He escaped through Czechoslovakia. He went through Yugoslavia. He eventually wound up in the United States. Many years later, wound up teaching at Yale. He was a famous kind of anti-communist historian. 
The other, his friend, and exact with the exact same background, Marcus Wolf, made exactly the opposite decision and decided to stay in East Germany. And he, he moved up through the ranks and he eventually became the East German spy boss. And he was famously known as the man without a face because no one had seen a photograph of him. And he was the one who recruited agents in East Germany and in NATO and sorry, in West Germany and NATO and so on. Um, supposedly he was the model for John le Carre's character, Carla. He was a sort of consummate spy. Um, and so he stayed very much within the system and was part of it. And so, and the question is, you know, when you look at their biographies together, the question is why? I mean, if you look, you know, they came from the same place. They had the same kind of family. They had the same background. They had the same opportunities. They had the same education. So what was it that made one of them say, I can't bear this, and the other one say, I'll go along with it? And the rest of the piece, I mean, maybe annoyingly for some people and maybe even for my editors, there isn't one answer and there isn't a single explanation. You know, I, I, I explained that there are a lot of reasons why people make these choices. And as, Je as, as, as you just said, Jeff, you know, there are a lot of, in particular, the temptations to collaborate and the, the ease that the decision to collaborate, the sort of the path that's laid out for you if you decide to collaborate is so much easier to take and so rewarding in so many ways that it isn't surprising that most people at the end of the day are Marcus Wolf and not Wolfgang Leonard. Right, right. So take us up to, I mean, this is a little bit of a spoiler alert because um, the piece goes from East German history, American current events um, uh, in a very clever way, I think. But um, take us to Republicans in the, in the Senate right now. Um, when we started talking about this piece a long time ago, um, I think both of us uh, were struck in particular. We, you know, traveled in the uh, same reporting circles and the, the um, same foreign policy circles. And I think among other people, uh, people like Lindsey Graham, people like Marco Rubio for me, Tom Cotton even, um, uh, people I covered and people I've known fairly well, as have you, uh, the fact that they went along and are still going along with just on the foreign policy and defense area alone is 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 kind of remarkable given given who they were or who they ostensibly were um and and you know the conclusion that we both drew in these conversations is that is that these guys in some way are are more interesting than trump because trump doesn't exist without these guys I mean, if, if there were no Senate Republican support for Donald Trump and his policies, there would be no relevant Donald Trump. Um, no, you're gone, but, yeah. So, so, or, or totally neutered, you know, or, or, or totally neutralized um, as, a, as a force in politics. Um, so talk a little bit about um, this guy we both know fairly well, Lindsey Graham, and your surprise or lack of surprise that, um, that Lindsey Graham of all people, again, coming back to, you know, McCain's wingman, like yeah. literally known, known as McCain's wingman, um, would, would wind up behaving the way he's behaved over the last four years. Were it's you like, surprised ultimately? I, I, I was, I mean, su surprised, although when you think it through, you know, less so. I mean, so, was, so in the piece, I did another pairing. So I had Marcus Wolf and Wolfgang Leonard, who were unfamiliar to most readers. But then I chose Lindsey Graham and Mitt Romney. And I showed that unlike the, the other two, they had very different backgrounds. You know, Graham comes from South Carolina, from a small town. He has a very important military background. You know, the Air Force paid for him to go through college. His parents died young. He took care of his sister famously, who's, who adores him. Um, you know, he has, a, he has the, the kind of life that in a, if you were writing a novel, you would make this the character who stands by his ideals and stands up for his country and sticks to his old friends. You know, he has all the kind of, you know, all the, all the attributes of someone like that. Right. Whereas right. if you look at Mitt Romney. I, um, loved to be like the junior maverick in the yes. in the in the dynamic duo of McCain and Graham. Yes, yes, and he was love, very love close that to role. love that role. Yeah, love that role was close to McCain, you know, McCain was also famous for his devotion to kind of not, you know, American democracy and democracy abroad and democracy around the world and you know, Graham kind of went off for all that as well and so on. 
and he was kind of set up to be McCain's heir in a certain sense. And if you compare him to someone like Mitt Romney, who is someone who kind of might have been able to be in either party, who is from various different parts of the country. So he's sort of from Michigan, where his father was, uh, was in politics, and he's sort of from Massachusetts, where he was governor. He's sort of from Utah, where he has ties, um, because he's a, a Mormon and pa family there and so on. So he kind of moves around. He was an you know, investment banker. That's not really a profession that we think of as being terribly moral, um, to put it mildly. Um, he's changed his mind about things a lot of times. So he wasn't the person who you would think would stand up and say, you know, I just can't bear this, you know, breaking of my ideals. And, you know, I can't stand the fact that Trump is manipulating U.S. foreign policy for his own benefit, which is what the impeachment, you know, so-called trial was really about. The, um, 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 and, 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 yet they, and yet it was Romney in the end who was the only one in the Senate who stood up and said, you know, I just can't vote for this. Um, and it's Graham who has not just voted for it, but excused it and gone along with it and played golf with Trump and appeared on television defending Trump and, you know, was the one who kind of went all in for, for an ideology, which, as I say, was pretty much in direct contradiction with everything we thought Lindsey Graham stood for, certainly everything that McCain ever stood for. Um, and yet he went along with it. And so then, it, once again, the question is why? And then once again, I give the reader an irritatingly complicated answer in which I don't say it's because X, but I, I give these, these possible explanations. And the explanations begin with, uh, you know, a, 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 you know a, a recognition that very often these, these things happen in stages. So most people think of themselves as good people and most people who work for the US government think of themselves as patriots. And they want to believe that they're in there to do, you know, very few people really go into government for money. You can't make that much money in the U.S. political system. It's not doesn't not set up like that or didn't, not until not, did not historically. Um, and so most of them think of themselves as good people. And so the, at, but as Trump came in, a lot of people went to work for him thinking, well, I know he's problematic, but he is the president. And, you know. but, and, and they were, but they were forced to step by step and stage by stage accept things that were offensive or things that they knew were lies or things that were in contradiction to whatever they believed. And as they began to do so, they began to make a series of excuses. And again, some of them are very well-meaning. You know, there, there are people who have said to me, and I quote some of them in the piece, things like, well, in, if I stay inside in this job, I can do some good. I can help people in the world. I can I can achieve um, uh, you know I can achieve something on behalf of oppressed people in China. I can do something. There are people who say, and this is what we heard from the anonymous writer of the New York in the, who, who published that long piece in the New York Times. There are people who say, well, I, if I stay in this job, I can protect the country from Donald Trump. You know, I can remove the papers from his desk when he's about to sign. You know, say the U.S. is leaving NATO or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, and then and then you progress you know along the line right down to the people who begin to see this as, an, as, a, as a financial opportunity or a personal opportunity. You know, Trump is corrupt, so maybe I can be too. Um, to the people who become nihilistic and cynical and say, well, you know, the president's gonna lie, it's okay for me to lie. You know, the president can sleep with porn stars. You know, I'm allowed to do all kinds of things too. And, 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 and gradually, you know, people come to conform um, and, and do things they, they never imagined that they would be doing. Um, and so it's a kind of slippery slope is the argument. Um, you, know, and there are the, you know, at each point you can stop and some people do, some people did famously during the impeachment hearings, you know, a couple of people who'd been working for the administration came out and you know, told the truth. Um, but some people have, are still there. Let me ask you this very broad question. Um, in the Along the roller coaster ride of the last four years, when were you most worried about the durability of our democracy? Um, or is that moment right now, the moment of maximum worry right now? I ask because the mood around Trump, around the issue of Trump, has shifted a bit, not only because polls are showing that he might have a difficult time gaining reelection. Um, but but because in many ways, and as our colleague David Frum has, has, has noted um, and others have noted, he's not very good 
in some ways at using the levers of power available to him to manipulate things his way. He's good at tweeting about it, but less good at actually engineering um, the kind of, let's even be dramatic and call it the kind of soft coup or the soft totalitarianism that people feared. But where where are you on on the on the emotional roller coaster of thinking? Wow, American democracy is really under threat. So I, I did fear it from the beginning. I feared it during his campaign. Um, I was one of the people who'd watched his relationships with Russia for a long time and and worried about that very very early on. Um, I worried, and this is in the piece, the very very first thing he did when he became president, if you remember, was to insist that there had been larger crowds at his inauguration than there had been at Obama's inauguration, which is stupid and silly and petty, except that he made the Park Service lie about it. He made them republish photos of the of the day, you know, cropped so that it looked like there were more people there. He made his press spokesman lie about it. You know, this was somebody who was willing to lie, even though um, people knew he was lying. In other words, you know, the, it was a it was an attempt to show that he had power over the system rather than just a lie. I mean, it wasn't just about making people believe him. Right. It was about exerting his authority over, over the rules and traditions of, of democracy. So I've worried about it from the beginning. Um, I have to say that since the failure to impeach him, I've worried a lot more. I mean, I, the anxiety ratcheted up, partly because after that happened, there was this kind of mood inside the White House, okay, now we're gonna go and root out everybody who we don't like. And there's been a doubling down in the Justice Department on trying to, you know, get Trump's friends, either, you know, get them better sentences or, or stop their investigations. Um, there have been a lot of firings taking place around around Washington. Um, you know, a, a few days ago, I wrote, a, I wrote an, another article about how um, the Trump administration has finally gotten around to taking over um, the, the United States um, broadcasting networks. This is the Voice of America plus Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, a group of kind of radio and television um, and broadcasting networks, some of which are staffed by incredibly brave people who do really important jobs. Um, and they've taken it over in a, just an amazingly East German way. I mean, to you know, fire all the heads of the departments and put in a fake board of directors who have no experience at all, except for their ideological links to the Trump administration. I mean, this is what this is what people do in illiberal countries when they want to wreck institutions, and this is very familiar to me from um, modern Poland, actually, too. So, it, um, so, so it was with uh, it was with those um, with that moment. You know, it began to seem really extreme. I mean, the the break on it right now, of course, is the possibility that Trump might lose, um, and and I think that's. You know, we might, you know, we might be, there are things that we might be able to rescue because simply, you know, six months from now, somebody else will be there. Um, but I am worried about him trying to cheat during the election. I'm worried about new scale levels of voter suppression that we've never seen before. Um, I'm worried about what kind of propaganda they're going to use to convince people to vote or not to vote. Um, so, so the, you know, it's clear to me that they will use anything they can right now to win. Um, and we are at a very dangerous moment. I mean, as that institution after institution has now fallen, um, they've put, you know, you sort of- Consider them having fallen. I mean, State Department, Justice Department, so on. You yeah, think they've I, fundamentally fallen. I mean, look, there's still career service or foreign service officers and their career Justice Department people who are there kind of hunkered down trying to do their jobs. I mean, I had a somebody I know at the State Department at the very beginning um, said to me, she said, look, you know, until somebody tells me you know, not to support democracy around the world, I'm gonna keep doing it. Um, and there are lots of people in jobs there. And, and I should be clear actually, that I know there are lots of good people all over the government um, who are trying to do their jobs. It's not, I'm not attacking um, people who work, you know, who work in the government. I, it's many hundreds of thousands of people who are, who are very good. Um, but, but yeah, I do think that the, the capture of the top levels of some of these institutions um, with people who are now really quite irresponsible it's not just sort of, you know, people who are half-hearted like Rex Tillerson was, or people who are, you know, um, sort of, you know, you know, lazy. You know, I mean, it's 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 now people who are um, deeply irresponsible. I mean, that's what's happened at at at, at Voice of America, for example, right. who, are, who are in charge. And if that goes on, um, we will have to, you know, in a way, the 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 fact that. 
um, the, the, the politicization of U.S. public health has already had a catastrophic effect. I mean, we're already seeing the effects of politicizing the CDC, of you know, not listening to, to ex scientific experts, not using science in trying to deal with a big crisis like this. I mean, that's one example of w what else will happen. I mean, all these institutions can go haywire um, in the way that we've seen public health go haywire in the United States. Right. Let me let me let me ask you this based on your extensive experience in Eastern Europe. But posit that Trump loses in November. Um, does Trumpism survive as the nucleus of the modern Republican Party? Or um, do you think there's a chance that it kind of dissipates because people like Lindsey Graham and others say, OK, that was that phase of of republicanism and now we're moving to a new phase. I mean, what, you know, what, I'm not talking about the damage, potential damage long-term to the government. I'm talking about what, what happens to the, to, the, to, the, to the movement itself, do you think? So a lot depends on if he loses. A lot depends on how badly he loses. Um, a lot depends on whether the Senate, become, you know, s s switches and becomes democratic. Um, a lot become, you know, if there is a total wipeout, you know, which is not impossible. Um, then you will have, then there is a group of conservatives. Um, you can call them the never Trumpers, you can call them something else, who will stand up and say, we told you so, you know, and now it's time to reform our party. And that group of people will then have a kind of credibility that they don't have right now. I mean, one of, to me, one of the most interesting things happening in politics right now is there are two groups, um, um, one is called the Lincoln Project. The other is called, it was called, you know, Republicans who, well, it was called Republicans for the Rule of Law. I think it's changed its name slightly. But these are two groups of ex-Republicans who are putting out videos and ads against Trump and calling on people to vote for Biden. Um, and those people, you know, will have an I told you so authority and they will have something to say after this election um, and in the, in the nature of what comes next. But, um, you know, but if it's close, you know, if lots of Trumpist senators and candidates survive, um, if people still feel that that's a formula that can win, um, yeah. then you then it's possible that it survives and it becomes the the modern Republican. You know, the the, the I next. Guess way, I guess another way to phrase the question is is will people be complicit after there's nothing to be complicit with, or is the movement so firmly ensconced in the Republican Party that? Well, this is just the Republican Party at this point. I don't know yeah, if we, I think, we can talk I, 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 think it, I think it depends. I mean, the weirdness of Trump is sort of Trumpism is that, as I say, it's none of the things that it was meant to be. Um, it was nothing to do with helping the ordinary working man, you know, who, in fact, were taking away the ordinary working man's health care. Um, and so, uh, and you know, helped. it's very... <laughs> It, and his actual health, health. yeah. And yeah. his actual health. And so, and, and because of that, it's become very personal to him. It's, you know, do you have loyalty to him? Um, and I tend to think that when he's gone, people won't. Um, I also think that if, as I say, if it turns out that his winning formula, which is to consolidate sort of, you know, white post-Confederate, um, you know, America into a into a, a you know an enthusiastic voting block. If that's a if that's a, a failed strategy, um, then I think people will try something else. I mean, you know, politicians are affected by whether or not they think they're going to win or lose. And one of the one of the issues over the last three years for a lot of politicians has been the fear of being primaried by a pro-Trump opponent. You know, so one of the reasons people towed the line was they wanted to you know keep their Senate seat or keep their House seat. Um, and they were worried about being anti-Trump and therefore losing their seat. You know, if that flips and it turns out that Trumpism is bad for you and you might lose your seat that way, then, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the vector of conformism will swing the other way. Right. So that's possible. Um, uh, let me go to a couple of questions. We have a lot of questions from uh, our many viewers. Um, uh, this is from Tom Burnett or Burnett as uh, described as a retired Navy captain. Um, what is the extent of the military pushback right now? And what's the relevance of that? Well, Jeff, you could answer that question as well as I could. I mean, so yes, one of the 
um, fascinating thing that's happened in the last couple of weeks has been the number of very senior military officers who have begun to say publicly that in particular that they objected to Trump's what looked like Trump's attempted to use the military and military symbolism and maybe even real soldiers um, in um, you know, in pushing back against protesters, um, particularly in Washington, but, but also elsewhere. And the, you know, very firm statements from the most senior possible people, um, including um, the former defense secretary, James Mattis, um, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, General Milley. You know, and th those have been, I think, very significant. And so my, my experience, you know, I haven't spoken to every officer in the, in the US military, but my experience, and I, I, I think it's probably similar to what you have, have heard, is that very senior officers in the military are pretty unanimous in their fear and worry about Trump, that he will somehow damage their institution um, isn't, this the yeah. great, isn't this one of the great inoculations against your own fear of permanent authoritarianism? I mean, it's kind of hard to um, to, to rebuild America as a semi-totalitarian state if you can't get military leadership to go along with you. Yeah, I've never I've never been worried about this kind of semi-totalitarianism in America. I've been more worried about kind of an illiberal anti-democratic populism, which is something a little bit different. Right. Um, and one of the one of the bad signs would be, you know, if Trump were able to recruit, I don't know, younger officers, for example. I mean, there's always going to be a layer of younger officers who want to take over the jobs from the senior officers. And any attempt, actually, I mean, this would be one thing to watch very carefully. You know, any Trump attempt to decapitate the military in any way would be an absolute, you know, flashing warning bell. I mean, that's that's again what happens in countries where. Um, where where people want to carry out an institutional takeover, um, but yeah, no, I mean the, the the military is one of the institutions that seems to have able to push back, um, and that's a that's of course a great relief. Right. Here's a question from Chalama Rao. Uh, uh, this is actually this is a fascinating question because I think this is the very human question at the core of something that we're talking about. What do these enablers, um, what, what might be, they be thinking about the kind of US that they will be leaving for their children and grandchildren? And what are they thinking, do you think, about their own legacy? It's kind of this, 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 this very human, like what are you, what's your long-term play here? Well, the, I, and this is one of the things that the piece is about. I mean, many of them have a story that explains what they're doing and justifies it. Uh, as I said, either I'm doing good here, or I'm protecting the country here, or I'm, you know, I'm making America great again. I mean, they, they many of them are, you know, don't think of themselves as enablers. They think of themselves as somehow, you know, they've somehow shoehorned their patriotism into their current positions and jobs. They've kind of done a very twisted and complicated um, ideological you know, somersault that convinces themselves and seeks to convince other people that what they're doing is good. Um, you know, and a few of them may not think that, and those few have, you know, you've seen some of them resign um, or quietly slip away in some cases. Um, but but m most of them, you know, a lot of them think, you know, have managed to, to you know, to justify it to themselves. Do you think that, um, let's imagine, imagine a genuinely post-Trump political future. Um, do you think that the people who are most closely associated with Trump, his Senate enablers, members of his cabinet and so on, do you think that um, they have a future in politics if Trumpism is, not just Trump, but Trumpism is somehow rejected? Um, I would imagine some of them, some of them won't. I mean, they would be, you know, they, you know, people, I would think Lindsey Graham would be eternally tarred by this, you know, by this little episode um, and that it would be hard for him to return, um, you know, but again, a lot depends on what happens over the next six months um, right. and how Trump is perceived six months from now, you know, after he's lost or after the Republican Senate has been wiped out. And as I said, if it's close, you know, if it, there's a sense that, you know, he's out, but the Republicans keep control of the Senate, they can continue to harass President Biden, um, then there, you know, then many of them will continue to, to, to stay around. I mean, you know, also, don't forget, I mean, the human brain's capacity for 
sort of self-justification or forgetting what we did yesterday is, um, is really infinite. I mean, one of the amusing things about the post-communist world is the number of kind of really ex-communists who will now look at you straight in the face and say, what are you talking about? I never believed in any of that garbage. You know, what, who do you take me for? Do you think I was, I believed it when I was, you know, chairman of ideology of the Soviet Communist Party? You know, you think I'm silly? <clears throat> That's an actual quote, by the way, from no. <laughs> the chairman of ideology of the Soviet Union. I don't know what would make anyone think that they believed it, right? But, but people, you know, people will say, you know, it will suddenly turn out afterwards that everybody was a secret dissident and that people were doing all kinds of brave things behind the scenes and they didn't really believe it all along and so on. So there'll be a lot of that as well. Right. Well, it's true that the, the main rationalization I've heard from people I know well who've gone in gone partially or all the way in in defense of Trump is that um, I'm guard, I'm the guardrail. I'm the, you know, I mean, that's, and by the way, it's not the worst excuse talking about Jim Mattis. When Jim Mattis went into uh, the administration, a lot of people who knew him and respected him said, thank God he's going in because yeah. he will be the grown up in the room, the, the guardrail, the this, the that, and the other thing. I mean, what Trump does is he pushes away the, the guardrails over time. So, that becomes a less salient um, kind of argument as, as time went on. A second term would be almost revolutionarily different and then it wouldn't start with these guardrails or adults. It would start with the yeah. core of the core. Uh, the, the, this, the second term would look more like this recent takeover of Voice of America. It would be um, out, you know, ra ra out and out radical outsiders um, stepping in and destroying things. I mean, I think it would be from the beginning, and also the kinds of people who would then be attracted to work in the administration would be completely different. So what I you're mean, saying is that in, in, in a theoretical Trump second term, you will long for the days of Bill Barr. Yes, but you'll wish, <laughs> that's right. you'll, and you'll definitely long for the days of Jim Mattis. You know, you'll wish we had people like that still in the government. I mean, then you will have completely Okay, yeah. different kind of cabinet and different kinds of people attracted to the administration. It will be, um, you know, a lot of it, there's a, a, you know, there's a whole cadres of people who were fired from their previous government jobs or who resent, um, you know, the, you know, the, the current heads of departments in the state department. And those people will, um, those people will, um, you know, flood back into the government and seek to take over, um, and, you know, and seek your, your to producer and director is walking behind you at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. He had to get some files. Apologies. No, no. <laughs> Welcome to COVID broadcasting. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this question from Shira Aviona from Massachusetts. Um, it's, it's an interesting question for you as an expert. Um, in reading about Polish nationalists, I was often struck by their desire to produce nationalist culture, art, music, history, et cetera. I haven't seen as much cultural engagement from Trumpists. Am I missing something? If not, why do you think Trumpists haven't engaged in cultural propaganda? That is actually an interesting point. Um, and I don't know the answer. Um, it's true that they haven't yet smashed up the Smithsonian, for example. Um, and they haven't, I mean, it's also, I think it may be partly because in the United States, the government has much less control over culture than it does in some other European countries. Um, so, you know, in Poland, there's like a minister of culture who, funds the museums and has a lot of money to give away to people who want to make movies and can support artists and theaters and so on. And in the United States, that's much more diffuse. We don't have a kind of culture minister who, who has that role. Um, uh, you know, so, but, you know, it could be another thing that we would then see in the, in the second term is sort of attempts to mold Hollywood to be, you know, more in the image of Trump or, you know, again, attempts to put pressure on the Smithsonian to put exhibitions, history exhibitions of a kind that would be more favorable to the Trumpist view of the world. Yeah, I can imagine that, but it's a good point that they have not, they haven't tried to do that. I mean, it may also be that the people who are around Trump don't have that kind of imagination. I mean, it doesn't seem like that's Ivanka's thing, really, culture, but- well, you, know. you know, you you mentioned that we had as a guest uh, on this broadcast last week, Lonnie Bunch, the secretary of the Smithsonian. Um, All and, right. And I could, um, it's, it's actually very interesting. I could imagine him resisting, obviously, any attempt to tamper with the autonomy and independence of his own historians and interpreters uh, of the American experience. But it, it's interesting that we haven't, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say this because I'm tempted to. <laughs> Don't give him any ideas. It's that people haven't gone into 
uh, I mean, now it's closed, obviously, but the uh, American History Museum and said, I don't like the way this event is portrayed. You know, we, we as the government, we should be, be, be doing this differently. It's, it's an interesting point. Let me ask a couple of more from, we have so many questions from people. Carter Wilkie asks a very interesting question. Does your analysis of enablers apply also to the so-called good cops who stand in solidarity, again, in scare quotes, with bad cops when they're accused of misdeeds? That's interesting in the current context. I mean, I think that's a slightly different um, psychology. Um, you know, that's a, you know, that's a kind of esprit de corps. Sorry? A tribal more than? It's than a bit more tribal and more institutional. You know, I need to stand by my institution and make sure that um, you know, that it, that it survives. And, uh, you know, it's probably quite short sighted because the bad, you know, the bad cops will go to jail or if, I mean, if they've broken the law, so, um, there's not that much to stand by, but yeah, I mean, some of the, some of the psychology may also be parallel again, you know, I don't want, um, you know, you know, again, it's this, it's this, it's this ability, this convincing yourself that what you're doing is right, you know, and so they will have an image of themselves as, as kind of guardians of the institution. So this is my, um, you know, the, I'm a policeman, I need to stand up for all policemen. So what I'm doing is helping the future of policemen, even though, you know, in that particular moment, it's, you know, it's, it's actually damaging. Right. Um, Michael Bone asks, um, and this is a very, this is the question at the core of what we might call the mystery of Lindsey Graham. Um, in the case of Lindsey Graham, could it be that McCain was his spine? Um, and then when McCain died, Trump came to power, was was his spine just replaced by Trump's spine? Well, th this is the, you know, and I didn't sort of- Weakness as the sort of dominant feature of, of complicity. Yeah, this, so this was, a lot of people said this to me. I didn't put this in the piece because I don't, have special insight into Lindsey Graham's brain and I can't prove this and so on. But yes, many people said, you know, he's somebody whose parents died when he was young. He seems to be, you know, he's in throughout his life, he's attached himself to other figures. Um, someone described to me as like, being like a pilot fish. That's a kind of fish that attaches itself to other fish, you know, um, and that he attached himself to McCain. And then when McCain died, he needed another, you know, so that he's somebody who actually is, um, quite weak as a character um, and and needs to be in somebody else's wake and in some other stronger person's wake. And actually there is a quote in the piece from kind of friend of mine who sees Graham from time to time and says, you know, when she sees him and he's just been talking to Trump, he's like a high school kid who's just met the quarterback, you know, look, the big, really popular kid was nice to me. And, you know, now I'm important again and I, I have access to power and so on. And so there is a, there is a way relevant in other words yeah he, his desire is to be relevant to be kind of important and mccain used to make him important and now you know now it's trump who makes him important so there there could well be some deep psychological explanation for that right right we're not going to diagnose that we're not going to we're just going to let his psychiatrist deal with that and we're gonna just let him be right <laughs> hey, um can I ask you this, um, and we're gonna to come to the close of this in a minute. Um, thank you everyone who's, who's listening in and, um, and also sending in your questions. Um, the, you're, you're an American who spends a lot of time in Europe and studying the history of authoritarian regimes, totalitarian regimes. Um, does, your, does your view of American exceptionalism change now? And exceptionalism in one specific subcategory of exceptionalism. Um, and I'm projecting a little bit my own shift. I always assumed that we were immune to the same forces of populism and nationalism and ethnic resentment and all this, all, all the things that you sort of see throughout European history. I thought we might be more immune to that. I mean, obviously we have, we go forward, we go backwards in America, just like any other place, but I thought we would be immune, immune to that. And now I, 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 I think that maybe the U.S. is a little bit less exceptional than than I used to, and that we can no longer look at Vichy France and say, "Ah, nobody, how could that?" We we are not made up that way, you know. Uh, I mean, have you have you given thought about how how to refract this experience through the prism of kind of uh, exceptional American idea? Um, I'm so glad you brought up this subject because that is actually what my 
forthcoming book is about, partly. Um, oh, is it? That's interesting. <laughs> I did not know. There's a chapter or two that setup, are, but it's sort of a setup. Okay. Specifically about that, so I don't. No, I know you. Way, your book forthcoming is built on the foundation of a piece you wrote for us two years ago on sort of what on we, Europe could be coming here. Yes. Just looking for the record. Yes. I, I mean, so I've always, I, a long, long, long time ago, it's about 20 years ago now. I wrote a piece. This is when I worked for the Spectator, a British magazine. Um, and I wrote a piece, and I can't even remember now what the reason, what the peg for it was, but I wrote a piece arguing that if Britain had been occupied by the Nazis, the British would have collaborated. So I wrote this in the, sometime in the 90s. Um, and people were outraged, you know, by this piece, and they were furious. We are not like that at all. But, but actually, with that train of thought, you know, that any civilization can go wrong and any democracy can fail, and there are no perfect societies is something that I've believed for a long time. I mean, so it's maybe my innate pessimism or I don't know, I spend too much time in Central Europe or something, but um, you know, I, I, I do think America is exceptional and special in a lot of ways. And the role that America has played in, in promoting democracy is first establishing its very unique democracy and its unique constitution and promoting democracy around the world. And I, I still believe there's a role for the United States that's exceptional and unusual in world history. But that doesn't mean that Americans can't also suffer the same, um, you know, the same failures that Europeans have suffered. Um, um, you know, the, my, my, my new book, which is called Twilight of Democracy, I, I go back through some of the early commentary, you know, Thomas Jefferson actually had this idea that Americans were immune for what he called European diseases, you know, that they would be somehow they, because we come from this fresh new land and we haven't had this, all this history on top of us that we can reinvent ourselves and democracy will be different here. Um, and that was always, um, you know, that was always an illusion. And there, you know, and the, the, you know, we, we, we like to forget that we, we've already lived through a huge democratic crisis, which was the crisis of the civil war. Um, in which a part of the country, not only did the South secede, um, but it set up a kind of authoritarian mini state. I mean, that's what the Confederacy was. Um, and the idea that, um, you know, that somehow Americans can't behave like that um, is one of our illusions. I mean, I think it's important to lose that illusion because it reminds us that democracy is something that you have to work on constantly, constantly and continually reinvent it and continually think how to fix it. Um, and continually develop it and change it. You know, what, if you just leave it alone and forget about it and think it's all going to happen by itself, this is when you you can you can lose democracy. And this was great. Um, uh, I know our readers love reading you, and they can't wait for your next piece. That's not pressure. That's just an observation. <laughs> just an observation. Um, and uh, your new book is out next month, right? It's 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 July publication, Twilight of Democracy. Um, and of course, your cover story uh, is out now. You can find it on the web. You can find it on a newsstand if there are still newsstands. Uh, there are a few. If there are a few newsstands left. Uh, and I encourage everyone who hasn't read it to read it. And, and let me just say uh, thank you to Anne and thank you to uh, all of you for, for joining us today. Appreciate it very much. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Thanks Jim. Thanks, Anne. Thank you.